Oh, well, thank you for the, the introduction, for inviting me to, to speak today. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I wanted to start by addressing the reason why ultimately we're all in the RF community, why we're dealing with these sort of problems, and that's because communications and transmitting information is really the backbone of today's world. Everything, the world is built on data communications. But, big concern, less than 10% of the Earth's surface is accessible to terrestrial networks, and less than half of the current population is accessible to terrestrial means. That's a problem. All of the advantages and all the benefits that we get as a, as a global community can't be gained with everyone that's disconnected. And in those contexts, places where there is no terrestrial network, there is no fiber, there's no cell network, satellite communications is the only option. And that's where isotropic systems is working to address one part of that problem. Uh, given this, uh, this community, I'd like to start with an introduction to the general uh, development in the satellite industry, where that's going, where the problems are, and then isotropic systems uh, input into that. So, satellite industry, it's uh, you put something up in the sky, you bounce a signal off of it, and you receive it on the downside, and you transmit again, and it comes back down. It's relatively simple in the grand scheme of things, but there's a lot of uh, different ways that that can be done. The most common differentiators between different uh, communications modes depend on the orbit, depend on the type of satellite, and uh, also depend on what's the, the exact purpose. So there's a lot of satellites up there. Uh, in the news very recently, there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about new satellites, new constellations, 20,000, 40,000 satellites, five, another 500 here, another 1,000 there. And uh, different orbits, we're starting to have in, in the public uh, uh, just broad, uh, broad news talking about LEO constellations and uh, geosynchronous orbits that previously is a very technical topic. So obviously used for a lot of government purposes, Earth observation versus communications. Uh, one point of reference that'll, that'll be useful later on, right now there's far under 1,000 communication satellites in orbit. And right now, there is less than, I believe, four terabits of satellite communications, general SATCOM capacity globally. Keep those numbers in mind. Uh, right now, today, the way the industry works, it's been the same for many years. It's a, compared to the terrestrial industry, it is a very tradition-based uh, system. When you have a, an infrastructure that you launch and it has to be in orbit for over 15 years in order to turn a profit and you can't touch the hardware in that time, well, you are a little bit careful with what you put into orbit. Uh, it's fixed terminals. You point at a geostationary satellite and you leave your, your dish pointed there. And when you have millions of people looking at the same satellite and you don't want to go have a truck roll to millions of subscribers to go push them two degrees to the right to the next satellite over, well, once you pick a satellite, your, your business is sort of locked into that. Everything's at geo satellites because if they're not at geo, then you do need a tracking dish. Benefit of a fixed terminal, it's cheap. You can get a $100 piece of metal and put some circuitry on the front and you'll get a connection. That doesn't work as soon as either you or the satellite is moving. Up until very recently, there was a very small number of satellites that had massive capacity and they would cover very large swaths of the Earth all at once, both for broadcast as well as for communications. This was efficient, you have a 36 megahertz transponder and you, you fill that capacity with as much signal and as much data as you can in order to cover as many people as you can and that's what's actually quite efficient. With one satellite, one transmission, you can cover a third of the Earth as long as that entire third of the Earth wants to hear all the same thing. However, this is not, what I'm showing here is not where the world is going because data communications by direction uh, is, is where the world needs to go. People aren't watching TV, they're not listening to a broadcast, they want on, on the fly, on demand, streamed content. And that means millions of individual screams, streams rather than one stream of data multiplied a million times. Another development. Lots and lots of rockets. This really gets a lot of attention. Rockets are cool. And so the likes of SpaceX and the likes of uh, Blue Origin, there's, a, there's several folks in the UK and in Europe who are developing new launchers all over the world. And what they're doing, they're breaking a lot of rules. Uh, they're saying, well, you know, we don't have to 
do things the way everyone else has done it. We don't have to do it the NASA way or the Boeing way or the Lockheed way. We're gonna try to do it actually affordable. We're gonna relaunch the same rocket twice. That's gonna make a major difference. Uh, right now, one of the reasons why satellites are so expensive is because it costs so much to launch a pound into orbit that you might as well make sure that it can do enough. And so launching disposable satellites is only just now starting to become worthwhile purely for the launch cost, let alone the costs of the hardware. Uh, by decreasing this, this cost to orbit, first it is a lot cheaper to get to LEO than it is to get all the way up to the, the geostationary orbit. And with these new reusable launchers, the costs are plummeting, which means a lot more folks are trying to get to space in useful ways, including doing tiny satellites that actually are gonna be available for, for commercial use. Uh, the change to high throughput satellite. This is referring to, instead of a traditional satellite that does cover somewhere around a third of the Earth all at once, moving to having lots and lots of spot beams. This uses the same, uh, same methods as terrestrial cellular communications, where you're breaking the cells up into small pieces and, and uh, using, using lots of frequency reuse to multiply the capacity where you would have one channel, one frequency allocated to an entire continent. Now that can get broken down into lots of small pieces and you can reuse that hundreds of times. With spectrum as one of the truly non-renewable and limited and finite resources in the world, finding a way to break it up into smaller pieces and reuse each of those more efficiently definitely is valuable. And that's one of the reasons for the massive uptake in, uh, in capacity recently. So, with all of those uh, changes before, the increase in the launch capacity and decrease in cost, the ability to break things up into smaller pieces, reuse spectrum, those combine to give us the, the LEO constellations. Now it seems like every week someone else is talking about launching another several hundred or thousand satellites to provide commercial service, to do Earth observation, uh, to do a number of other things up in space. Uh, the big ones that get the news, OneWeb, uh, SES Empower, Starlink uh, from SpaceX, Telesat is launching a number, LeoSat, and then there's Amazon, and then there's, there's uh, more than I can count. Now that number that I said earlier, that today there's around four terabits of global uh, satellite internet capacity in the world today on less than a thousand satellites. SES Empower with eight satellites in medium Earth orbit will supply eight terabits by itself, tripling the world capacity by only adding another eight additional satellites to their existing network. Starlink, no one knows how much capacity it is, but it's, that, that multiplies by an even more massive number. Same thing for all the rest of these. So that's gonna have a major step change in the industry. When capacity, when the access to a megahertz, which is how capacity is priced, is, it comes down, Access to satellite no longer is the expensive last resort that no one wants to use because it's slow and high latency and, and, and it, you do everything you can to avoid it. These new networks, if any one of them is successful, is going to probably give fiber a run for its money in a lot of cases. Not always. Anywhere you have fiber, you can always drop more capacity that one location over a physical connection than you can over satellite. However, fiber will never make it to a moving plane You'll never be connecting fiber to the middle of the ocean. And there's many places, even, even in the UK, you're on the train, many, many places you don't have terrestrial connections. And this is one of the densest population areas of the world. So moving to new bands, early SATCOM was fairly low frequency, L and C band. It keeps moving up, this gets into the millimeter wave, which a lot of the conversations today are gonna to be looking at. Um, going into KU and KA, the, the VSAT or very small aperture uh, terminal bands are the ones where most of this new capacity is coming into play. There is a trade there. The more frequent, the higher up in frequency you go, the more capacity you get, the more spectrum in terms of megahertz and gigahertz you get. Uh, but the higher the frequency, the more variation you have to account for in your link budgets around the uh, uh, rain attenuation and uh, moisture in the atmosphere. KA is particularly poor in that regard. Uh, typically, you'll end up with a KA terminal for 30 gigahertz and a KU terminal for 15 gigahertz. They'll be the same size. They'll be rated for similar bit rates, even though the KA terminal has 6 dB more gain for that same size, simply to account for that extra rain attenuation. But for the likes of an aircraft, you're above the clouds. You don't care. And that means you get a lot more capacity for, uh, uh, for, for your antenna.
there's a lot of talk, folks talking right now around V-band, Q-band going up to 80 gigahertz, and there's uh, a lot of benefits there. As hard as it is right now for the satellite industry to work with 30 gigahertz terminals, the, the terminals are going to be the limiting factor. The ability to access that, that spectrum is going to be the limiting factor for those higher frequencies. So the ground terminals. Satellites in the sky don't do any good whatsoever if you can't talk to them. Whether they're looking at the sky or at the ground or get doing Earth observation or you're using them as a communication satellite, you have to talk to them. Early terminals were multiple meters, very small aperture uh, terminals. VSAT actually refers to anything smaller than two meters. It doesn't sound very small. Uh, these days, terminals are, are typically around the 65 centimeter to 1 to 1.2 meter range. But once you put them in a radome, they end up looking a lot larger. Uh, the more satellites that we have, the more access to capacity, the cheaper everything needs to be because if you want to, try to get rid of hundreds of terabits of capacity, which these new networks will need to, you need to distribute that much capacity and you need millions upon millions of subscribers. There's fewer than on the order of a million or so subscribers to, to SATCOM these days. How many billion folks have cell phones? And without millions and tens of millions plus, the market never gets commoditized. A million is tiny these days. So folks are going to Leo and Mio. Lots more, a lot lower latency. I'm convinced that these Leo networks will have lower latency than fiber because you'll go right up to a satellite and right down the data center, right over the air. Glass is two thirds the speed of light. It'll probably be faster going over, uh, going over satellite in that case. More capacity, multiplying the capacity by those amounts and 90% of those networks will be idle at any given moment because most of them are over the ocean. So that's going to, there's gonna be some creative thinking around how do they use all that capacity and some interesting applications for taking advantage of it. More users is a requirement, uh, all the way down to making it such that people don't know or care, whether it's terrestrial, whether it's satellite, it's no longer the area of least resort, it's, it's just communication. Now think of Star Trek, flipping over the communicator, that easy. However, none of that will work with current antennas on the ground. With all of these innovations, much better electronics, more satellites, much better circuitry, which it advances every year. On the ground, still has all these problems. If you need a massive reflector that has to physically move to track a satellite, and that satellite's only in view for three minutes, that doesn't work all that well. So beam forming for satellite antennas, uh, one of the, the distinctions against terrestrial that took me a while to really catch on to is you are operating at the limit of your signal noise ratio. Satellite standards uh, and modems can operate down to minus 10 dB signal noise ratio and often do. Um, that means you never see a nice clean constellation. You're, you're, you're dealing with this most of the time. And so your signal noise ratio and your front end uh, G over T noise figure is absolutely critical. It's the only thing you really care about. You size your antenna for that receive capability. You make sure that you have enough transmit going out. And uh, in general, that's, that's going to end up working. But that is ultimately what drives the size of the antennas. Uh, when you're putting in a, a a antenna to take advantage of scarce capacity, you're using up something like a 32 megahertz transponder. You want to get enough uh, efficiency out of that to make it worth your while to rent a significant piece of that satellite. So that means that you need a big antenna to get enough spectral efficiency in that five to six bits per hertz range to be useful. So very large antenna gains, very large apertures, and that is to take advantage or to, to power through that 200 dB of attenuation between you and the satellite. So these are the, the basic antennas. In a mobility situation where either the satellite's moving in non-geostationary orbit or the user is moving on the ground, which are the only places that ultimately you can't get fiber to, you end up needing a dish, a piece of metal that itself is quite cheap, but it's got a track. It has to track within about two-tenths of a degree and typically within about one-tenth of a degree uh, at all times. And it has to know where it's pointed. It's required by law to shut down if it ever deviates. These get very pricey. They work, uh, but they don't move very fast. And if you, again, you're having to hand over between satellites every few minutes, uh, it gets a little bit troublesome. If every phone call in an, in an area drops every three minutes, I think people start getting upset. So then you need two antennas and you double your cost. Phased arrays, of course, that's what a lot of the folks today are gonna be talking about. There's a lot of benefits in that area. Uh, comes with its, with its counterpoints. So 
a, a KU phased array that gives reasonable performance and, and gets high bandwidth at well, KU band 10 to 15 gigahertz, you might need 4,000 elements in that phased array and can often take over a kilowatt. That's not something you can put on the back of a car and uh, first not blister the paint from all that heat as well as be able to power it off the battery. So dealing with the power is a major problem. It does need to be low profile. It can be low weight compared to a big mechanical structure. It can steer very fast. There's nothing wrong with the performance of a phased array. Problem is it's just too expensive to buy 4,000 millimeter wave beam formers effectively and put it all together. Works fine for the military and it works fine for the folks that already have the money to pay for it, but if we want millions upon millions of more subscribers, that's not gonna work. So Isotropic came in with this, this problem statement of we think the industry needs more subscribers. The, the industry with all these new launches, uh, there's a number of, of different folks and, and many of them are in the UK trying to solve the problem of the ground terminal to enable connection to existing and new satellites in a more effective way. Uh, we're doing so by looking at phased array and saying that is an effective solution to the problem. It takes advantage of developments in, in the circuits and the RF community driven by the people in this room. But that architecture is not moving fast enough in the right direction to reduce the power and the cost simply by building a, a better chip that improves by a few percentage points every year. It needs a, an architectural change that changes that equation and allows us to access satellite capacity at a much better way. So it does need to be electrically steered. It needs to be able to talk to multiple satellites at once because if you're moving around and having to change between satellites, you don't want to drop that connection. It needs to be high gain. It needs to be high efficiency, measured in aperture efficiency as well as in front end loss before it hits the first amplifier. It needs to be low enough cost that you can reach your intended customers. Now, low cost doesn't mean the same thing for every market, of course. Low power which also translates to low heat. Uh, water cooling is a challenge in many cases, but if you're putting a kilowatt for KU and several kilowatts for a KA antenna, that's not very practical. Uh, high instantaneous bandwidth, one problem with phased arrays using phase shifting is that you get beam squint. It's uh, phase shifters are dispersive by nature and you might point and be fine at tw uh, 21 gigahertz exactly, but you can only really put maybe 10 to 25 megahertz through that signal until you're getting away from your pointing accuracy at the edges of your band, at the edges of that, uh, of that bandwidth. New satellites need 100 to 500 megahertz, and so beam squint is not acceptable. That means you end up having to go to true time delay, which then multiplies your cost even further. And true time delay in this case means many wavelengths, many nanoseconds worth of delay accumulated, not just within one period of a cycle, of a because that is no better than a phase shifter in that case. So Isotropic Systems was founded about five years ago in order to develop a new kind of phased array that architecturally changes how it's doing beamforming. We're doing a hybrid system that does beamforming at two stages. We do initial passive beamforming using uh, high efficiency optically inspired microwave lenses. These are passive devices, they aren't active, they aren't doing anything internally. Uh, but there's a lot of complex structure in order to get us the, the scanning properties that we need. So by turning on one or more of these feeds at a time, we direct a signal through the, uh, through the lens and that steers in a certain direction. Thus far, nothing's really new other than we're able to do these lenses much better than has been reported elsewhere. Then if you combine all these together, so say you'd like to, to steer beam in the blue direction, you turn on every individual lens, you point it in that direction, it's coarse scanning, it's only getting you within three to five to 10 degrees of your target. And then you use a conventional phased array approaches to do it the rest of the way. Advantages of this, because we're adding extra complexity, we're doing something else with it, we have to have a reason. Reason is because you don't have to populate the entire surface underneath that with feeds. We're chopping the number of feeds, the number of circuits in a given aperture by a significant margin. That reduces cost, and since we aren't turning them all on, we save a lot of power, particularly on receive. Um, animation there is showing the, the behavior of the field at the TD simulation going through the lens. One other benefit of this is since we are only turning on a limited number of these at a time, we can imagine overlaying those three images. We have separate signal paths and we can have multi-beam talking to multiple satellites at once, different orbits, different constellations, 
uh, without having to double the circuitry. If you take a conventional phased array, you end up having to put two phase shifters and a combiner at every element if you want to try to steer in two directions at once. And if you're transmitting, you're sharing your HPA power. In this case, we do not. So in a conventional phased array, the entire aperture is full. Not much you can do with that. There's some tricks you can play to, to thin things a little bit, but if you're trying to scan out to nearly as near the horizon as you can get, 60 degrees is considered pretty good. 70 degrees if you're really good. Uh, really not that much you can do. You can consider an optical antenna, and by that I consider that a, a reflector. A reflector has a single feed, it's quite efficient in that sense, and it generates a very nice, very large beam. That's the biggest antennas are always reflectors and always will be in my opinion. However, they don't scan very well. You can go a few degrees off from center, from a parabolic, until your signal starts degrading very severely. Typically, it's measured in beam widths, a few beam widths away from your center, and you've dropped by enough that it's just not interesting anymore. Uh, some ways to get around that, of course, you can have shaped subreflectors. The big uh, radio telescopes end up using spherical antennas and having pre-correction on it. That's not gonna work for low-cost antennas. In our case, we believe we're taking the best of both of these. Phased arrays are very flexible. They give you amazing control over the signal, pattern control. You can, you can uh, shape your signal in order to uh, uh, fit the particular regions or steer in different directions on a live and instantaneous practically basis. But at a power and a cost that's not reasonable, optical is efficient and it is taking advantage of the native properties of materials in order to do what you need. So we put them together. Our particular architecture allows us a lot of flexibility. We don't have to keep that full array. If we're only scanning a few degrees, we only use the feeds that we need. So this gives us an advantage in tailoring systems towards, uh, uh, towards particular, particular applications. Uh, you only pay at any given moment for what you use, and we can customize things, customize the antenna for a given application, however many beams, however much scanning uh, that might be required. So, in summary, there's a lot of exciting changes right now in the satellite industry. A lot of new rockets, a lot of new constellations. The RF innovation that's going on right now by everyone in this room is going on to those spacecraft that is enabling them to have a lot more capabilities, increasing the RF power that they have accessible to bring them down to the ground. And that is an important part. But also on, on the ground, there's all this innovation is also going into building better chips, better circuits, better processing that then allows the terminals to get cheaper. And we're not the only ones doing this. Uh, there's, and we're not building the only solution, but we believe that we've got a, a significant uh, benefit for the slide, satellite industry as a whole. And uh, we, we are a UK-based company. Our office is, is in Reading. Uh, we also have a, an engineering center in the US and Maryland. We are hiring. Uh, we're pretty much always gonna be hiring. Our uh, product release is, is coming up quick. And we've got a lot of work to do between now and then. So I'd be happy to take any questions and uh, I'd be happy to talk to any of you after the break.